sharing with the uh, manager of the hotel that when I walked in this room, it, it uh, reminded me that I had been in this room before uh, with the prime minister. I think it was uh, he was not the prime minister at that particular point in time. But uh, as, as many of you know, I've, I've been uh, coming to uh, Israel for some time. My first trip was in 1992. I was the agriculture commissioner of the state of Texas, and uh, we uh, signed a memorandum of understanding uh, between the state of Israel and the state of Texas uh, to share um, semi-arid land studies, professors, and, and what have you. And, and uh, I suppose that MOU is still um, still going. And, and anyway, it's a, a great opportunity for me to come again uh, in a little different role, uh, but uh, in, in the same uh, uh, same amount of awe that I always have when I come to Israel. Uh, it's just an extraordinary country with uh, amazing people. Um, I share in a, just a side note that uh, uh, you can't be uh, a uh, freedom-loving Texan uh, and a freedom-loving Israeli and have gone to Masada and visited the Alamo. <laughs> there's, uh, uh, there's a great connection to uh, uh, the state of Texas and to, uh, to the state of Israel. So uh, anyway, it is it's always a special occasion and experience uh, for me to uh, be back here as a proud member of the uh, cabinet of President Trump. And uh, uh, I recognize uh, that uh, under his leadership and the leadership of Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, who I will see uh, tomorrow, um, I, I don't believe our bond with Israel has been any stronger, certainly not uh, in my lifetime. Um, I want to echo the President's congratulations to the Prime Minister, as a matter of fact, uh, who has just become Israel's longest serving Prime Minister. Uh, his leadership and vision has uh, changed uh, the course of history. It has made Israel the country that it is today. Uh, the bilateral relationship between the United States and Israel, it's built on a foundation of strong economic and security cooperation. As the U.S. Secretary of Energy, I have enjoyed a productive working relationship with Minister Steinitz. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if my memory serves me correct, the first person who I met with after I was sworn in as the Secretary of Energy was uh, uh, Minister Steinitz. And uh, during the time that uh, we have been in our our roles. Uh, we have been working uh, bilaterally in the area of energy, cybersecurity, water issues, uh, to name just a few. Now, over the last decade, uh, both Israel and the United States has undergone a massive transition in our energy supply with the discovery and the production of cleaner burning natural gas. Uh, earlier today, I visited the Noble uh, Energy Facility in Ashdod. Uh, it's a great example of U.S. technology, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, company working with Israel in this energy field. Uh, it's my hope that this is just the first chapter of a very long story of further American investment uh, in Israel's energy sector. Because of projects like this, uh, for this first time in its history, Israel is approaching energy self-sufficiency, looking to export its resources. Mr. Steinitz has said that Israel's natural gas has the potential to be a game changer in relations with regional neighbors such as Jordan and Egypt, and he is absolutely correct. This morning, we met and discussed the important new energy cooperation occurring between Israel, Egypt, and Jordan. This partnership is energy uh, between these three nations. This is a, is a historic moment. Um, it's proof positive that the exchange of energy has the potential to positively impact geopolitical challenges, even those with deep roots, no matter what the hemisphere. 
Uh, this is why the diversity of supply, the diversity of suppliers, uh, the diversity of supply routes is so important. Again, no matter what region of the globe you find yourself in. To that end, Minister Steinitz and I will travel to Cairo later this week to participate in the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. Uh, we're going to meet with our counterparts who give us the opportunity uh, to discuss these international energy uh, cooperations. Another critical piece of our work with Israel, cybersecurity, to respond to the increasing threats from bad actors, including Iran and others. Uh, the United States and Israel are elevating our joint work uh, on cybersecurity in the energy sector, focusing on training, sharing cyber best practices, and workforce development strategies. Tomorrow I will tour the Israel Computer Emergency Response Team and Energy Security Operations Center in Beersheba. Uh, I'll see firsthand the work that they do and the collaboration, the information sharing, the training that is done with the United States. And in just a few weeks, an Israeli delegation will travel to the United States to visit DOE's national labs to share best practices and uh, continue this collaboration on cybersecurity issues. This year, I was pleased to announce with Minister Steinitz the creation of the future U.S. Israel Center of Excellence in Energy Engineering and Water Technology. The energy water nexus uh, will be one focus of the center. Uh, I, from my previous experiences as the agriculture commissioner of the state of Texas, the governor of the state of Texas, um, I know firsthand there is no better partner uh, in this issue than Israel. President Trump has asked me, um, or I should say he's, he's actually tasked me with uh, an effort to advance transformational technology and innovation to meet the global need for safe and secure and affordable water. Uh, I look forward to hearing directly from Israel's subject matter experts tomorrow, learning more about uh, new technologies, new advances that are being made in that arena that uh, Israel is leading the world in. So finally, I look forward uh, to meeting with the Prime Minister uh, tomorrow. We have a shared friendship for many years. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this room some 20 plus years ago, he was here uh, discussing some issues that we were, were working on. I'm sure neither one of us uh, recognized that uh, or thought even possible that uh, I would be the governor of the great state of Texas for 14 plus years and uh, I think he's just passed over the 13-year threshold with no, many, no telling how many more years ahead of him. So I look forward to seeing him and continuing a great relationship. So thank you all for coming and let me open it up and attempt to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, just tell me who you are and um, your name, please. Just Certainly. Trey Inks with Fox News. Right. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Yes, sir. Uh, the Iraqis recently announced they're building pipelines through Jordan and Syria to export oil. Is the administration concerned about the vulnerability of such pipelines when it comes to security threats from bad actors yes. like Iran? I, I think we, we all have, listen, we're, we're adults here. We know what the threats are. We understand who the bad actors are. Um, we're also, uh, we're, we're also very focused on um, solutions to those challenges. Uh, and, and there are a host of, of, of areas, you know, on the cyber side, on the, uh, on the aviation side, on other security uh, aspects when it comes to pipelines, as you ask about with specificity there. So, of course, we're, we're concerned about it. Uh, but the other side of it is uh, that uh, being able to, to deliver uh, this energy with multiple routes, again, as I said in my remarks, uh, multiple sources, multiple routes, multiple fuels. We think all of that is an important portfolio of which to, um, to 
to have so that uh, uh, you can even even if you had one or the other or a number of those that get compromised because of bad actors uh, you still have the ability to deliver uh, your your fuel to uh, your to your citizens yes sir Barack Ravid from Axios and Channel 13 News in Israel. Um, the U.S. is uh, promoting a nuclear deal with Saudi Arabia, uh, giving licenses to U.S. companies to sell uh, nuclear reactors to Saudi Arabia, something that the Israeli government is very uh, concerned about, mainly the possibility of enrichment, uranium enrichment in Saudi Arabia. What kind of assurances you are going to give Prime Minister Netanyahu tomorrow on this issue when you meet? Yeah. The, the, the same assurance that we would give uh, any leader uh, across the, uh, the country, across the globe, uh, is that for uh, the United States to go into a civil nuclear agreement with any country uh, would require a one, two, three agreement. So uh, now that's, you know, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but uh, a one, two, three agreement. Um, would have to be signed, and that is the uh, prohibition of, of, of any uh, development of, uh, of, of high-level nuclear fuel. The, I, I think sometimes people get a little bit confused um, about a, a what we call a Part A-10, uh, which is just the, that's basically saying that you can have a conversation with a, a U.S. company about uh, a technology. It has nothing to do with saying, okay, we're going to go forward with that. So, um, and, and here's what, here's both my personal, I think, professional, and, and I think this is the U.S. position as well. Uh, if you are going to see a civil nuclear program, no matter where in the world, the United States needs to be involved with that because of our a non-proliferation uh, uh, posture. Uh, you know, the Chinese, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Koreans, uh, they don't have that non-proliferation. The Russians, uh, they don't have that non-proliferation mentality. Uh, we haven't seen it, let me put it that way. So I think it's very important as we, uh, in the neighborhood, uh, we have this conversation that the U.S. be involved, that the U.S. Uh, and our one, two, three agreement uh, be a very important part of that. So, so you are against enrichment in Saudi Arabia? Um, for the purposes of uh, for the purposes of a civil program, we want to look at what their uh, how that program would work. So, I mean, we're a long, long way away from that. But if you're making the point of are we uh, are are we against the, uh, 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 the the process for something outside of uh, civil nuclear, of course. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Noga Ternopolsky from the LA Times. Um, I want to ask you about a wider strategic issue. In the President's tweets of the last week or so, he has mentioned Israel, if, if I'm not mistaken, daily or almost daily in the context of um, attacking Democratic Congresswomen. And I wonder, given Israel's vulnerabilities in this region, given the growing legitimacy of anti-Israel actions and sentiments in Europe, um, what do you think about dragging Israel into this kind of partisan um, I, I, I'm, I don't arguments know, I don't on the, on the cyber sphere? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following your, your nexus here. I think if, the, if you're saying the president is against anti-Semitism, I agree with him. That's not what I'm saying. The okay. president has, has tweeted uh, attacks against Democratic Congresswomen and has brought up Israel's name in those attacks, saying that if anyone, if Israel's important to the U.S. voter, they have to vote against these yeah, people, I, against I, the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm not sure I saw that. Um, you may be taking a little bit of license there. Uh, I think what the president, here's, I'll give you my read on it, um, and just for purposes of clarity here, in September of 2014, I gave a fairly lengthy speech in London at the uh, 
Royal Uniform Service Institute about anti-Semitism. So from, from my perspective, what the President is saying, whether it's to a member of Com Congress or whether it's to a citizen of, of the United States or anywhere else, you need to be really careful about statements that create a sense of anti-Semitism, wherever it may be in the world. And I think that, from my perspective, that's what the President's saying. Don't, don't create a climate with your rhetoric that can be, that either clearly or that can be construed as anti-Semitic. Yes, sir. Has voiced Israel in the past a lot of concern about Chinese investments in Israel and that they need to monitor it much more. Is this something that came up uh, today in your talks with Steiners or something that you will bring up tomorrow with the Prime Minister? And is this something that, that, that is indeed concerning the, the U.S.? I mean, are they worried that Israel might not be working fast enough to monitor the massive Chinese investment here? Well, here's what I think we try to um, impress upon all of our allies is that there are areas that China is involved with, particularly the collection of information uh, that we've got great concerns about, uh, you know, on, on the cybersecurity side of things. Uh, so I think that's the, the, the bigger issue. Um, you know, we, we, want, we want our allies to be knowledgeable about um, the activities that the Chinese are involved with. We, have great trust that uh, the leadership of this country will make the right decisions about, you know, any investments. There's a difference between somebody coming and investing and the issue of cybersecurity and collection of information that will go back and be given to the communist Chinese government. Yes, sir. I, uh, Secretary Pompeo said recently that the UK should take care of its own ships in the Middle East. Will Israel get the same uh, response if it ever got under Iranian uh, attack? I think if the question is that every government should be using their own um, and their and, and, I, and I, I didn't hear the Secretary Pompeo saying, and I didn't take it in the sense, if, from what I'm hearing you, that if a United Kingdom ship is attacked in the Straits of Hormuz, then that's the UK's business to take care of it. That's not what you said, was yeah, it? Yeah, he said it today on Fox News. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, then I, I'm not aware of, of that statement. Uh, I think we have, uh, and and we've seen the, uh, we've seen the United States. We've seen our allies working together uh, when, uh, when some event occurs where we have either the citizens of our country or the um, uh, the property of our, our country. I I I I'd want to take a uh, a closer look at his statement before I. Uh, I make any further statement, but I, I think taking care of, of our of our allies together has historically been our uh, our, our MO in the United States, and for that matter, um, other countries looking after uh, U.S. assets that might they might be able to protect. So, yes, sir. Charles Fisher, Market Newspaper. Uh, how the prospects of meaningful surge in oil prices? might affect any decision of imposing uh, uh, more sanctions on Iran or even uh, make a bigger move on that issue? Yeah. Well, the, the bigger issue here is, is Iran going to be a good citizen uh, in the world? Are, are the activities that they're going to be involved with? The President uh, clearly has said that Iran is not a good citizen. They're not a good neighbor. Uh, the activities that they're involved with, the funding of the terrorism that they've been uh, engaged in is not acceptable behavior. That's the reason he pulled out of the JCPOA. Um, and so 
there are two different issues here. The other that you ask about was uh, the oil market, uh, what's going to happen in the oil market, the United States and our go. Uh, you know, it's a great story from my perspective. Ten years ago, the United States and Israel uh, were dependent on countries to supply their energy that weren't necessarily our friends in some cases. Uh, today, the United States is the number one oil and gas producing country in the world. Um, Israel is about to be a, an exporter of natural gas. I mean, th those are some stunning developments because of innovation and because of, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the free market uh, mentality that's out there. You've got a U.S. company that's come in to, uh, to help you develop uh, those fields in the Mediterranean. Uh, you've seen this massive private sector in the United States through hydraulic fracturing, directional drilling, become the number one oil and gas producing country in the world. Our job, our goal, <laughs> is to be a supplier of those fuels. Uh, we're now develop or not developing, we're now supplying 36 countries on five continents with LNG that's uh, coming out of the United States. Uh, this East Med pipeline the, that's a potential for uh, European gas, uh, your ability to supply both Egypt and Jordan and hopefully other countries in the Middle East with uh, uh, Mediterranean gas, Th that is a good, um, that's a good development. And so these new supplies should help keep a steady supply uh, of, of fuel, whether it's crude, whether it's natural gas, whatever, uh, you know, secondary products that come out of that. So, uh, you know, I think you'll see less uh, displacement of the market when there is an event like we see happening. Uh, I think the Iranians are going to have a more difficult time in, in influencing the market than they would have maybe 10 years ago. Thank you all for coming in. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Here he is. Last question. The last, no, yeah, Steve share with last me. man sorry. sitting. Um, first of all, d does that mean that you're not um, concerned about the spike in oil prices? They were up 2% uh, today before. Uh, also concerned two about it. I, I, I think, you know, that may be a... I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about a lot of things. Uh, I think the question, we find ourselves in a completely different position than we were a decade ago, than, than we were five years ago. So uh, having a supply that will keep the market as steady as it can be is our goal. Uh, as I, you know, as I have correspondence, as I talk with uh, with my counterparts across the, the globe, the the vast majority of those people are about keeping a steady supply. So if there is a disruption somewhere, let's say there's a, a major hurricane that comes into um, southern part of the United States and uh, and, and causes the uh, big disruption of the uh, continental pipeline that goes across the southern part of the United States. Uh, all of those are potentials, and they're all going to have some uh, jog in the market. But the goal here for us, whether you're in Saudi Arabia, whether you're uh, in some other country in the Middle East, by and large, uh, or if you're the United States, your goal is to supply a steady uh, or have a steady supply in the market so that you don't have these spikes uh, up or down in the marketplace. Yeah, you also mentioned Noble. Um, why is it that Noble is the only U.S. company that seems to participate, that wants to be here and involved in Israel's oil and uh, gas sector? And also one other thing is, do you believe that the, that the death of uh, the IEA chief, um, Amaro, is going to hurt your chances of curbing Iran's yeah. uh, nuclear program? I'm not sure that... Uh, Noble is the first. I would suggest to you they're probably not the last. And I don't, I'm not going to make any news here today, but uh, uh, there are other U.S. companies that are, um, and, and there are other international companies 
uh, that are looking, when, when you start finding oil, uh, particularly these private sector uh, free market oriented companies, uh, it, it won't take long for them to, uh, to show up and start drilling and being a part of this. Uh, let me finish up by saying that uh, uh, our, our prayers are, are, are with uh, uh, Director Romano's family. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was in our office uh, six months ago, and, and we had a great working relation for a decade. He had, uh, um, with great professionalism, uh, operated the uh, IAEA, and uh, we will miss his uh, very measured and thoughtful uh, approach to uh, the International uh, Atomic Energy uh, Agency, and, and uh, uh, we will we will miss him. He was a he was a really good man. Thank you all for coming and being with us today.